Call World is a decently vast and in-depth game that I have been anticipating for years. The attention to detail goes far deeper than I first thought, and it's really made me appreciate just how much you can do and how much can happen. The core mechanics of the game are what make it stand out amongst others. What if you took just one piece out of the equation? What if you removed a fundamental part of what makes Pal World tick? How far could you take it? This is the experiment I wished to conduct, and every second of it has been condensed down into this massive video. How much of the PAL deck can you complete if you cannot capture PALs using PAL spheres? Right, so, since this is the first big project I've done for a video, things, unsurprisingly, are a little bit scuffed. For whatever reason, the bitrate for these recordings was low, and for the first two sessions, I didn't actually keep notes. So I had to rewatch both of these sessions to take notes along the way. Look, this is uncharted territory for me. I'm flying by the seat of my pants here. Some of this was also streamed on Twitch. So if you'd like to hop in on the shenanigans, there will be a link in the description. You'll also be able to join the Discord server to get notified of streams and uploads. Oh, and before generating the world, I set the death floss to let me keep my equipment. My argument is that this isn't a challenge about combat or difficulty, but I figured that losing my inventory but keeping my equipment would still be a good middle ground. With that out of the way, Let's get started. My first big goal was to buy a PAL from a merchant, but I needed to set up a base of operations first. I collected up some necessary materials and food on my way through the starting area, leveled up twice along the way, and put a point each into stamina and carry weight. Since I was going to be doing a lot of things myself or with low quality PALs, those two stats alongside work speed were going to be important. I ran to the cliff where the skill fruit tree was on the other side and passed by the egg that was sitting there. I could just pick it up and begin hatching eggs pretty much as soon as I fought my first world boss, but I decided to hold off on even collecting eggs until I was level 19 and could begin breeding pals for eggs myself. I built a couple of foundations to make something of a shortcut and leapt across the cliff, grabbing the skill fruits and continuing onward. At one point during the stream, I did say that if I simply threw an empty sphere, then it would be challenge over, but I decided against that since it's quite easy to fat finger the button to throw spheres and you can't rebind the key. If I throw a sphere, I restart, basically. <laughs> An empty sphere, I should say. So I later decided that the challenge instead fails if I capture a pal with a pal sphere. I grabbed the fast travel near the Syndicate Tower and the one at the Desolate Church before finally reaching my desired base location. It was a patch of open land just north of the church, and after placing some foundations and building up the pal box, the land was mine to use. I then built a workbench, crafted up a torch and a stone pickaxe, and headed over to the small settlement to unlock its fast travel. Unsurprisingly, I couldn't afford anything from the PAL merchant, so I just went and sold some stuff off and went to try and find a source of money. Mining up ores turned out to be quite poor for profit, so I instead decided to level up a bit and raid a dungeon. I headed back to base to get organized, made an axe to collect materials for an old bow, leveled up in the process, and put the point into carry weight. Once I finished crafting the bow, I started making a handful of arrows when a wandering merchant stopped by. I decided to use some of my hard-earned money to buy some arrows to skip a bit of the crafting and went to get some XP at the starting area. After a bit of poaching, I teleported home since it was getting dark and I had no convenient cold protection. I built a 1x1 cube house to shove a bed into, and while building it, I was reminded of syndicate camps. Now that you mention it, JJ, I can actually see about uh, going to that syndicate camp near the uh, rain syndicate tower. Let's see if I can free a pal there. With the bed built, I went and raided the camp the next day. During the raid, I leveled up, freed a Vixie, and put my new skill point into stamina. With a new friend acquired, I quickly ran back to base to craft some cloth armor and went back to the settlement to sell some stuff. From here on though, I'll just notify you of anything notable instead of showing the stock each time. While I was there, I decided to see if eggs sold for anything, but unfortunately they don't. After trashing the egg, I hopped into the nearby dungeon, mined up the sulfur, grabbed a couple of chests, yeah, that's a weird looking piece of loot. It left without fighting the boss since I didn't quite have the gear for it. I also sold off the sulfur for a quick penny. Back at base, I built a ranch for Vixie since they'll dig up gold and spheres that I can sell. Building this thing took two and a half minutes. After it was built, I leveled up the base, sent Vixie out to begin ranching, built a feed box, and repaired my stuff. Afterward, I went and checked up on the camp that I just raided. I didn't know what the respawn time on these was, so I ended up checking on this more often than I really should've. These things take ages to respawn. 
I did remember the location of another camp, however, so I decided to go and raid that one after crafting myself a shield. At the camp, I dealt with the syndicate goons inside and freed a Swede from the cage. It had a fairly nice work speed trait that I could use for pal breeding later on. After the raid, I went back to the settlement, sold off the ammo and spheres that the thugs dropped, and went back to base. Nearby in my base was an area that had two camps fairly close to one another. Problem was, things in this area were at least 10 levels higher than I was and could easily wipe the floor with me if I wasn't careful. This raid would have to be a stealth operation. What's in there? The mud. This is about to be heist of the century right here. I was able to sneak in and grab the demud from its cage, leveling up in the process and managing to sneak out without much of a problem. Back in friendlier territory, I mined up some stone to build a berry plantation. I'll have to do the planting myself for the moment since I didn't have a pal that could handle planting for me. With the field planted, I grabbed some fiber to build a couple of pal beds, leveled up the base, and deposited all of my pals so that they could begin working. I then went back to the settlement and considered buying a cativa, but decided to hold off for the moment. Before heading back to the base, I went back to the starting area to grab a handful of berries for my pals, went back, planted the fields again, and went to the settlement again to sell some loot I had collected. There was now a Fox Sparks in stock, which I decided to buy since I was going to need a pal that could do kindling. Next, I decided to explore the fort north of the Chillet boss, but first, I needed to handle a couple of things back at base. I built a campfire and briefly deployed Fox Sparks to get a base upgrade, expanded the foundation, and did a bit of rearranging. I was interrupted by a raid of Lee's Punks, but with Copper Keys being a seemingly guaranteed drop from their drop table, I welcomed the fight. With that out of the way, I built a statue of power for the base upgrade requirement, and headed out to gather more materials to make a PAL gear workbench. Along the way, I unlocked a chest that I had seen earlier and got a rare quality cloth outfit schematic from it, which will come in handy later. Afterward, I went back to base, gathered a handful of wood, and built the workbench which allowed me to upgrade the base yet again. I crafted some arrows and went to check on the camp again. Surprise, surprise, and still wasn't there, so I decided instead to go unlock the fast travel near the Pen King boss. Along the way, I took note of a nearby camp across the water and decided to teleport home, put my important stuff away, and attempt to raid that camp as well. While running towards the camp, I found a locked chest that I couldn't open because conveniently all of my keys were no longer in my inventory, so I marked it on my map to come back to later. After some attempted stealth, I tried to move in to unlock the cage, but I was spotted pretty much immediately and had to run for the nearest fast travel. I made a pit stop at the settlement before returning home. On my way back, however, I got an idea. What if I just crafted and sold PAL spheres? Would it be profitable? I wonder if making PAL spheres would be profitable. Let me, let, let's, let's see. So it's one pallium, three wood, three stone. Let's see how much that sells for and make a PAL sphere and see how much PAL spheres sell, uh, sells for. Back at base, I crafted up a PAL sphere and brought it and its constituent parts to the merchant to see if it was profitable, which it was. So the materials sell for eight. But the spheres sell for 12. I see. Alright. So I decided that PAL sphere crafting would be one of my passive money makers moving forward, and started gathering materials to make more. I was raided by a couple of Toko Tokos while planting the fields again, which I dealt with rather swiftly. Afterward, I went and sold the PAL spheres that I made, and the two gunpowder that the birds had dropped. I then, yet again, checked on the yet to respawn camp. But instead of just going back to base, I raided the dungeon that was near the fast travel. I mined up the sulfur and the pallium inside, which broke my pickaxe in the process, grabbed a couple of chests, and that's another weird bit of loot, and left without fighting the boss, again. After that, I went and checked if crafting arrows was profitable, which unfortunately it wasn't. So I just sold the sulfur and other bits of loot instead. Back at base, I crafted a torch and ran to the black marketeer that was nearest to my base. There was also one that hangs out near the settlement, but for whatever reason, he wouldn't be there very often in the future and I have no idea what happened to him. Unsurprisingly, I couldn't afford anything, so I ran north to find a new fast travel to unlock, and came across another camp along the way. I got them distracted with a wild Mamorest, and was able to free the Nox within the camp before booking it to the nearest fast travel and getting away safely. Back at base, I did a bit of maintenance before going to check in on the merchants and the other Black Marketeer, who had a bunch of pals that I really wanted but ultimately couldn't afford. On my way to unlock another fast travel, I found yet another camp. It was just another Swede trapped in the cage, but I freed them anyway. 
During the raid, I leveled up and put the point into stamina after things quieted down. Since I now had a pal to spare, I decided to see if Black Marketeers bought pals for more gold than a pal merchant would, which unfortunately was not the case. He did have a couple of affordable pals, but I decided not to buy either of them since I needed a pal capable of planting. Though in hindsight, I probably could have used a Mao since they dig up gold while ranching. I teleported home to store some stuff away and went to check in with the merchants again. This time, a Cativa was in stock, which I decided to buy this time and deployed them back at base. I then gathered up the materials to build a logging site in the stone pit, planted the fields again, and was reminded of the chest that I passed by earlier, and went to open it, but it had despawned by this point. I went back to base, crafted some spheres to sell, and then decided to run around to fight pals for some EXP. During my mass poaching, I was reminded of world bosses, and I decided to take on the Chillet boss. On my way there, the camp had finally respawned, and I was able to free a caged Rabunny. I continued on, grabbing the fast travel near the fort, made a quick stop back at base to get more arrows, and fought the Chillet boss. Still hits me, what? Oh, this is 100% doable, actually. Yeah, well. Not bad at all. With the Chili Noodle defeated, I leveled up and put the point into carry weight. I returned to base to get organized and went to sell the loot that I had collected. There was also that rare quality cloth armor schematic that I had gotten earlier, but I needed some wool in order to craft it. So I decided to collect some after I made my sales at the settlement. As it turns out, loot items sell for a lot. Go figure. The Pal Merchant also had a Dire Howl for sale, which I immediately nabbed since they'll make a good travel buddy once I unlock the saddle. I slept in the night, went and grabbed some wool from the local wildlife, set my new cloth armor to craft, and after doing a bit of maintenance, it was time to end the stream and mark off the first of many, many sessions in this experimental playthrough. In the second session, I started doing stuff off stream. I started off by completing the cloth armor I had queued up previously, expanded the foundations, and was pretty much immediately raided by wild pals. After dealing with that, I crafted up some pal spheres and headed out. I checked on the camp near the tower, but it was empty of course, sold the spheres and did some hunting and gathering for EXP on my way to the camp near the settlement, cleared it out and freed yet another SWE. I then fought a pack of dire howls for more XP, but I ran out of arrows in the middle of the fight and had to resort to my axe. I leveled up on my way back to the settlement, unlocked the dire howl saddle, and put the point into work speed before pawning off my loot and going to the starting area to collect some more food. Back at base I refreshed some of my arrows and was raided again, but I dealt with it easily enough. I then expanded my storage and crafted more spheres, but from here on I'll just skip the mentions of crafting and notify you when I go to sell stuff until gold becomes a non-issue. At the settlement, I sold off my loot and noted the mozzarella in stock. Since I was going to be breeding pals in the future, I was going to need it in order to make cakes. Afterward, I decided to make the Dire Howl saddle. I needed some leather, so I went to grab some, and nearly died to Aether Deer in the process, and ran out of arrows again, having to resort to tagging pals with my melee weapon and letting my pals do the rest. I also fought some water-type pals since I was going to need fluids to make hot tubs in the future. I looped back to the starting area to start my route again and was nearly met with catastrophe. That was so freaking close. I fat fingered the throw spear button and almost hit the fox sparks I was hunting. After that close call, I returned home and crafted the saddle, stocked up on some arrows, and went to check in with the Black Marketeers. Unfortunately, I couldn't afford anything from the first one, and the second one I went to visit just wasn't there. From there, I backtracked the looted dungeon I had passed by. The boss at the end was a land ball this time, so I decided to fight it instead of just leaving. After the fight, I leveled up, put the point into work speed, and hit the absolute jackpot. What? A legendary quality crossbow and an amulet of diligence were definitely going to be immensely helpful in the coming days. I went to the settlement and bought a pengullet with a serious work trait before heading home. I crafted some more arrows, grabbed the materials to craft a three-shot bow, fought the chill-up boss again, and gathered wool and fluids on my way back to base where I crafted some head armor, built a furnace, expanded the foundation, and built a hot tub. The settlement had a mozzarella in stock the next time I checked, but I didn't have any money to buy it, so I dove into the nearby dungeon to get some loot to sell. 
I pretty much immediately broke my pickaxe, and after a quick repair, I leapt back into the dungeon and decided to fight the boss again. This time, I used an exploit to cycle the boss encounter, eventually getting bored of that and just fighting the boss Tansy. I leveled up and put the point into stamina. The loot wasn't spectacular this time around, but it did sell for a lot. Unfortunately, the Pal Merchant stock had already changed, so no Mots Arena for me at that moment. I did some repairs back at base and collected a bunch of resources. I was going to make a bunch of Pal Spheres, but I remembered my level up and saw that I had unlocked the high quality workbench. So I decided to build that first. I collected some ore, set it to smelt, expanded the foundations to move the Pal Beds, crafted some nails, and went to check in with the Merchant again. He had an affordable Mots Arena this time. I then went and built the workbench and took a look at the crossbow's materials. Needless to say, it was... expensive. Jeez, that's a lot of materials. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah, this is gonna take a while. <laughs> oh, no. I then crafted a spear, because I had never done that in this game before. Afterward, I went exploring to uncover more world bosses, and while riding a camp, I had my second lucky break. There's a freaking leaf monk in there. I think those can do planting. I'd been planting the fields manually this whole time, and the leaf monk I just freed meant that food was now automated, and I no longer had to worry about stocking the feed box myself. After deploying them at base, I started heading southwest. Part of my game plan was to establish bases in locales that were suitable for hatching eggs so I wouldn't have to deal with heaters or coolers, and my second base was going to be located along the southern rim of Mount Obsidian. The details of the saga will be covered later when I actually start exploring the place. I was briefly sidetracked by an undiscovered fast travel and a nearby camp, freeing the Bristla inside the cage before continuing onward, finding yet another camp and freeing the Floppy. From there, I kept traveling, uncovering bosses and grabbing loot along the way. Along this path was another set of merchants that I could check in with every so often, and after selling the stuff that I had collected at that point, I bought a gobfin? To be honest, I have no idea why. I also fought the Gumas boss, but there's not much to write home about with that one. After returning to base, I built a crusher to level it up, built a second berry plantation to level it up again, I then crafted my first parachute finally, and crafted Fox Sparks' harness since I happened to have the materials. On my search for more camps and dungeons, I freed a Dazzy from a camp and raided the nearby dungeon, making sure to put Fox Sparks to good use. I leveled up, put the point into stamina, and got a schematic for some decent cold resistant pelt armor. I returned the base briefly and decided to craft that armor and to start working towards the legendary crossbow. While running around for materials, I visited the Black Marketeer and made the mistake of selling both of my Swees, forgetting that one of them had Ceres as a passive trait, and bought the Flambell that he had. This turned out to be quite the poor choice, since Flambell usually gets stuck ranching and won't do anything else for a while. At base, I crafted the grappling gun, built the medieval medicine bench, leveled up the base, and collected the ores to eventually build a cooler box. I ran around to grab some flame organs to make a second furnace, and waited around for some ingots to smelt. I crafted a metal pickaxe, decided to settle on plain pelt armor for the time being, and crafted a metal axe. After that, I took note of the materials I needed for the crossbow, set myself in the nearby metal mine, and logged off for the day. In the next session while I was mining, I noticed that my grappling gun looked like a regular handgun while holstered, which is unusual to say the least. I mined up enough ore for just over 100 ingots and set Fox Sparks to work smelting it all. After a few ingots were finished, I did a bit of work throughout the night to let my pals regain some sanity while sleeping. There was also a loot chest just outside the base, which had some schematics for cold resistant armor. I then went on a boss run to get more ancient civilization pieces, grabbing some more pal fluids along the way to build more hot tubs later on. I found a lucky pal along the way, which I of course couldn't capture and just decided to kill. I then came across a dungeon, grabbing a bunch of loot and leveling up from the boss fight. I put the point into stamina and got a heat resistant undershirt from the loot chests. As I looked at the tech tree, I noted that it was kind of amusing how I got that legendary crossbow blueprint so early, and yet it's been unlocked before I've even started building it. Near the sweep of boss was a chest that contained a useful head armor schematic. I then returned to the base and began crafting the legendary crossbow, which, I kid you not, took 18 and a half minutes.
After that not so brief intermission, I built the small feed bag and went to go test out my new crossbow on the Chillet and Penking bosses. Leveling up and put the point into stamina along the way. Back at base, I dealt with the raid, built the sphere workbench, and went to see how profitable mega spheres were to craft. Oh, and I also briefly got stuck in the Pal Merchant's roof. That was a fun few seconds. What was even funner though was the Univolt he had in stock. With Swift. With my new mountain toe, sorry Dire Howl, I unlocked the Univolt saddle and grabbed the electric organs necessary to craft it. And believe me when I say, this guy is gonna make travel significantly easier. I ran around searching for dungeons, though unfortunately I couldn't ride around inside the dungeon because of a lighting glitch causing a heinous amount of flashing lights. While it is amusing for my unicorn to cosplay a police cruiser, I would rather not expose you guys to the eye strain that I, for some reason, put up with for a while. Throughout my dungeon crawling, I looted the Paldium inside. From the first dungeon, I got attack and defense pendants. From the second dungeon, I got skill fruits for Tri Lightning and Hydrojet, the former of which I gave to Univolt, and the last dungeon just had a couple of tech manuals. After that, I decided that was enough because the aforementioned flashing was making my eyes hurt. Outside the dungeons, I checked shops for pals. I saw another Univolt that had muscle head, but for some reason I passed up on it. I did buy a Marath with Ferocious, however. I then raided a camp to free a Pengullet, freed a Demud from another camp, fought the Gumas boss for my next level up, and put the point into stamina. I also went and grabbed some wheat seeds to build a wheat plantation, since that is an ingredient for cakes. With the plantation built, I went and grinded for some experience points. I considered making a mad dash north to a different low level area, but decided against it for the moment. I then fought the rain tower again, freed yet another Demud, this time with a ferocious trait, and on my way back to base, I accidentally glitched myself under the water. I have no idea how this happened, but in the moment I wondered if that could be used as some sort of speedrun tactic to clip through things and travel places, I don't know. Back at base, I decided to leave Fox Sparks to deal with Kindling because Flambelle, as I mentioned before, is just plain awful for that work type. I also crafted and sold some Mega Spheres alongside the loot I had gathered earlier. And to round out the session, I bought an Aether Deer and a Loot Moon. The next session started with me gathering ores for crossbow repairs later on. I finally decided to build a cooler box for the base upgrade, since this next one was going to give me access to a second base location. While the ingots were smelting, I made the tropical outfit and went to kill some time by checking shops and doing a bit of raiding. I bought a cheeky pea with a serious work trait from the settlement, and from the first dungeon I leveled up and put the point into carry weight. On my way through the second dungeon, I wanted to check in with the Black Marketeer, but he was nowhere to be seen. Through that dungeon though, I encountered a lucky daydream and promptly killed it, but somehow at the end of this dungeon there was no boss in it and the loot room was open. It makes me wonder if the lucky pal somehow made some wires cross and the game considered it the boss encounter. From the loot chest I got an epic quality schematic for some pelt armor. I then freed a Rabunny from a camp and sold a couple of pals to buy a bee guard. This was quite a lucky find since if I wasn't able to get a bee guard, I would have to kill Cinnaboss for honey, which would lengthen this process quite a bit. Back at base, I finally swapped out that flambelle for the bee guard, built the cooler box, and leveled up the base, finally getting access to my second pal box. After running a couple of errands, I ran out into the night towards Mount Obsidian. I wanted to build on something tall that couldn't be raided, and I was fine with a cramped location since I was only going to need it for incubators in the future anyway. The first spot I found had a dungeon entrance nearby, and I tried building up high near it, but the game wouldn't let me. After some finagling on a nearby platform, I managed to find a tiny spot where the game would let me build a pal box. I ran to the nearby village to grab its fast travel, remembered my level up from earlier, and unlocked some important technologies, one of which being the heat-resistant pelt armor. I briefly sidetracked to gather the materials to craft it before going on a boss run for EXP. Later on, I decided to go double check the second base's location. Since I had a ton of trouble building the pal box in the first place, I wondered if I could even build anything at all. And after screwing around with it for a while, I determined it to be unreliable and decided to pack it up and move elsewhere. I found a spot with some ore and coal nearby, and a small platform to place the pal box on. My theory is that raids needed to be able to path directly to the pal box in order to spawn in the first place, so I was fine with this location for the moment. Back at base, I dealt with a raid, which leveled me up, and I put the point into carry weight. With my ingot smelted, I built a cooking pot and a metal chest, which let me upgrade the base yet again. Segments from here are likely going to be shorter than the first few, and certainly shorter than the first. With a game like this, there's a lot of downtime to cut out. With that said, it's taken quite a bit of time to make this video, so if you enjoyed it, let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your feedback. The next session was quite a while after the previous, but I had been playing Pal World on my main profile in the meantime. And while I did, I came across an even better spot to build my volcano base. 
With the game plan in mind, I headed out for a specific landmark, a large Anubis statue in front of a waterfall. On one side of the waterfall was a couple of platforms that I could build on, and theoretically be completely safe from raids. Getting to the general area was the easy part, but actually scaling the cliffside would prove to be far more difficult. After fumbling around the cliffside a bit and nearly dying in the process, I scaled the walls directly next to the waterfall instead, and made it up after a few minutes of careful footwork. Well, that was a massive pain in the ass, but we made it up here. And that right there is going to be very handy later, actually. Wow. I built the power box in a specific spot to not only cover both platforms, but to also potentially allow for eggs and chests to spawn just outside it later on. Though, to be honest, I'm not entirely certain on those mechanics, but that huge dragon egg sitting nearby is going to be a massive boon later on. With the base relocated, I went back home to grab some wood for building foundations. I got a bit sidetracked because I wanted my pals to focus on the logging site instead of the trees scattered around the base, so I took the time to place some foundations to block them from spawning naturally. After being raided yet again and finishing what I was doing, I went and paved over the second base with foundations to have even ground the build on. I returned to base to repair my crossbow, did a bit more tidying up the foundations, and went to gather some materials to slowly work towards building this pelt armor that I got earlier. While I was gathering materials and XP, I got a ruby from a Relaxaurus, which was nice. I also got some schematics from dungeons, sold off the loot I got from those dungeons, and bought another Chicky Pea. I completely forgot I already had one, but hey, the more the merrier. I then raided a camp to free a Brisla and returned home. After crafting the headband, I went to collect leather for the armor. Along the way, I fought the Syndicate Tower and the nearby camp, freeing a Vixie, leveling up and putting the point into stamina. I made a quick pit stop at home, raided one more dungeon, and went back with the leather I had collected. I set the armor to craft and went to sell my loot. At this point, money is no longer an issue, so I'll just inform you when I buy something. I'm sure you can infer that I'll be selling loot from here on anyway. I can also buy pals for EXP on that note. I deposited my new Vixie at base and went on a shopping run, buying a Pen King, freeing a Nox from a camp along the way, and buying a Mao Christ. At home, I was, yet again, raided in the middle of doing a bit of maintenance. It was at this point that I decided I was eventually going to be moving this base as well, since I didn't want to have to constantly deal with raids. I prepped some cakes for some power breeding later on, since I was going to get to that level pretty soon, finished the pelt armor I had queued up earlier, and decided to mine up a bit of metal and take a short break, letting some time pass while my pals worked nearby. The Malchrist wasn't producing nearly as much gold as I thought it would, so I swapped it out for Vixie again, since it's just going to do everything better outright. With level 19 just around the corner, I went and grabbed some more EXP. The boss Broncheri gave me quite a bit of trouble, but I was eventually victorious. I then fought the Syndicate Tower again for the last pinch of EXP I needed, and put the point into carry weight. Back at home, I expanded the foundation and built the first breeding farm. As a reminder, at the start of this challenge, I said I couldn't even pick up eggs until I had bred some of my own. And now, with this built, the floodgates are close to opening. I then built some toolbox to help with handiwork, even though it feels like it does fuck all, and built a second breeding farm at the volcano base, though I might move that to the main base later. And when I next played, I did just that. You may also notice that the video quality seems a bit better. I changed some settings around and that seemed to do the trick for a bit rate. After relocating the breeding farm to the main base, I paved over the base with stone foundations and replaced some of the wood ones as well. While doing some rearranging, I was raided again. After dealing with that and finishing up with the base, I had a small workstation and four breeding farms to work with. But I pretty quickly realized a flaw. I didn't have the space needed to fill those farms, so I went and rebuilt the one back at the volcano base. I then threw my Marath in with the Nox just to see what would pop out. It was interesting to see that the progress bar will still fill even without a cake, but you still need to give them one in order for an egg to be produced. I got a large scorching egg from those two, which pretty much immediately validated my decision to build there. Except it doesn't, because the fire egg was too hot. After building a new incubator at the main base and fiddling with the temperature gauge, I started grappling with the realization that I will probably have to relocate again. While the egg was incubating, I checked shops, raided dungeons, and fought bosses for XP. Though I'll just skip over the ones I already fought unless I get a level up from one. I bought a serpent from a shop, freed a Nox, fought the Azeroth boss for the first time, freed a Tansy and a Mal Christ, looted a dungeon and got some good heat resistant pelt armor schematics, got a tech manual from another, bought a Jolt Hog with muscle head, raided a third dungeon but only got some mediocre skill fruits, and fought the Chillet boss for my level up, putting the point into carry weight. I also bought a Loot Moon with muscle head. Back at base, I was visited by another traveling merchant. I've never seen this happen more than once, so it was pretty cool to see. 
And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, these individual sections moving forward are going to be quite short, but now that we're approaching the point where I can begin breeding the hatching eggs that I collect, there's going to be even more downtime just waiting for the things to hatch. I likely won't be pointing out individual sessions anymore and just keep the commentary flowing from one thing to the next. When the egg was ready, a Wixen with Ferocious hatched, which was pretty cool. With my first egg bred and hatched, my next porter call was to find a good flying mount. I needed the aerial mobility for finding eggs and moving this experiment forward. I built a weapon workbench to level up the base, and stopped by the volcano base to grab the huge dragon egg that happened to be there when I set up shop. As it turns out, it was too hot for this one too. I freaking hate it here. I did try to see if a cooler would help, but I need an ice type pal to maintain it. I'm gonna have to find a slightly cooler location in the future to start hatching these eggs, because this simply will not do. I brought the egg bag home and just plopped it into the incubator next to a campfire. With that out of the way, I went to go check shops for flying mounts, as well as for new pals or ones with good traits. I bought an Alpha Dran with Swift, and freed a Fuddler from a camp, but with no gold left after buying the Alpha Dran, I decided to fight the bosses and clear some dungeons. Along the way, I freed a Breesla, a Fwack, and a Floopy. I then bought a Jolt Hog that had Workaholic and Ferocious, and looted a ton of dungeons. At home, I built more incubators and placed in a bunch of eggs that I had gathered. While waiting on them to hatch, I was ready again. I then hatched my first batch of wild eggs, getting a Lee's Punk Ignis, a Van Worm, a Fuddler, a Swee, which leveled me up and I put the point into carry weight, and hatched a Gale Claw. But unlike Van Worm, it's just a glider and not a mount. Conveniently, that level up let me unlock the Van Worm saddle and the musket. So I set the musket to craft and collected materials for the saddle, grabbing a large dark egg along the way. After that, I finished the musket, crafted the saddle, and hatched that huge dragon egg. Obtaining what will be the biggest asset to this run. A Yermintide Ignis. Oh yeah, now we're cooking with the gas. <laughs> with level 4 kindling, this big guy is the best pal available for baking cakes that I need to fuel this challenge in the first place. With my new flying mount and a dedicated chef, it was time to accelerate. I can go wherever I want and gather as many eggs as I can carry. With this, combined with some precise breeding to fill out the pal deck as best I can, it was all uphill from here. I rearranged my pals to get the bare minimum for resources so I could open up some space for breeding pairs. I relocated my furnaces since I forgot to do that earlier, enhanced the Ermintide's work speed, and gathered the materials to make a flame cauldron. While the ingots were smelting, I set my first sets of pals to breed. With the flame cauldron built, I went and checked shops, freeing a Toko Toko along the way. Though one of the thugs seemed to quite vehemently disagree with what I was doing. With that done, I bought a Cryo Lynx from a Black Marketeer, which took pretty much all of my gold and ended my shopping run right then and there. I then went to see what my Univolt and Cryo Lynx would produce, and I waited around for that to finish since I wasn't going to go anywhere fast without my mount. I hatched the large dark egg, which produced a Nox, and I placed the frozen egg that I got from Cryo Lynx and Univolt into the incubator. I also hatched a Leaf Monk with Workaholic, which I immediately deployed to work. I then set another Nox and a Mal Chris to breed while I go exploring and collecting wild eggs. At one point I freed a Dazzy, and later noted that the area I was in was somewhat warm. I might be able to comfortably hatch eggs in this place in the future, so I marked it down and kept moving. I bought a Rush Ore with Ferocious, and marked a decent looking spot for a mining camp I could potentially set up later on. After exploring two entire islands, I returned home, started incubating the egg that Nox and Mal produced, hatched a Grintail and a Sweepa, and then set a bunch of eggs I had collected into incubators. I hatched a Rush Ore with an insane amount of passives, was raided again because why the fuck not, built a chest to store eggs, crafted a shield, and deployed a Dazzy since nothing seemed to be getting transported to chests for some reason. I then did a bunch more exploring around Mount Obsidian. I bought a Melpaca from the Black Marketeer that I discovered and nearly died on my way out of the place. Back at home, I hatched an Ekthrodeer, an Arzox, another Fuddler, and a Rebunny. I also built a second chest because I had a ridiculous amount of Scorching Eggs. While waiting for more eggs to hatch, I tried to do a bit of research on what pals were and weren't obtainable during this playthrough and quickly realized that I was going to have to take the time to figure that out for myself. I then hatched a Tombat, a Dazzy, and a Hangu before chucking random pairs of pals into the breeding farms to see what pops out. After waiting another few minutes, I hatched a Loot Moon, a Serpent, a Breeslow Swift, and a Robin Quill. Cryolinx and Gale Claw also produced a huge rocky egg, which I was quite interested in seeing the contents of. I went and gathered some wool to make some cloth for more incubators, and freed a Jolt Hog Chris along the way. I also had yet another traveling merchant saw by the base, which makes for three totalist playthroughs so far, and built several more incubators. 
and then hatched a Tansy, a Brisla, a Leaf Monk, another Nox, and a Panking with Swift. From here on though, I'm only going to be pointing out new Pal deck entries or Pals of Good Traits just to cut down on bloat. With my incubators filled with wild eggs, I went and built an incubator specific to each breeding farm. I'll just have to build or remove campfires as and when I need them. I then hatched a Celeray, leveling up and putting the point into carry weight. I also hatched a Dire Howl with Musclehead. While waiting on eggs to hatch, I'll occasionally be exploring the world to loot dungeons, kill bosses, and shop for pals. I won't be mentioning the specifics anymore, but I will still let you know of when I level up, buy a free pal for a new deck entry, or if I happen to get some cool and unique loot. I came across a lucky Jolt Hog, which quickly became a lucky chunk of XP, leveled up from a dungeon, and put the point into carry weight. I then bought a Chillet and a Petalia before returning home, hatching a Kit Sun, a Vanworm with the Serious Trait, a Kelpsy Ignis, a Daydream, a Pyran Noct, a Reptyro, an Anubis from Cryolynx and Gale Claw's Egg, a Blaze Owl Noct with Artisan, and a Fanglobe from Robin Quill and Ichthyr's Egg. Oh, and a Depresso. I decided to keep an eye out for any Ichthyr Deers that have movement speed traits, since a fast Fanglobe will make ground travel a literal breeze. Also noted from the wiki that Vanworm and Anubis, when bred together, produces a Phalaris. At the beginning of this challenge, I didn't think I would be able to obtain these pseudo-legendary pals. But I've begun to realize that I might actually be able to in reality. I hatched a Loot Moon with Swift and Workaholic, Lee Punk Ignis with Ferocious and Workaholic, leveled up and put the point to work speed, and hatched another Lee's Punk with Sirius. I then built more cooking pots and realized I ran out of eggs to bake with, so I went to try and find a Chicky Pea for sale. I bought a Kremis for the Pal Deck entry, briefly returned home to build a couple of fluffy Pal Beds to level up the base, checked more shops for a Chicky Pea with no luck, and decided instead to explore some higher level areas to see if I could find some new Pals to liberate, and find some wild eggs to hatch. After a while though, I returned the base with only a handful. And as it turned out, I had a spare Chicky Pea in my Pal Box, so I deployed them. I popped the Phalaris egg into the incubator and took a few minutes to take note of what pals I didn't have and what I could use to breed for them using a breeding calculator, which I'll have linked in the description. I'll be using this calculator to more or less breed pals in pal deck order, but a lot of them do end up out of order because of me having to backtrack on the pal deck on occasion. From here, pal deck progress is going to be extremely fast and with very little distraction, so strap in. I hatched a Nightwing with Sirius and a Broncherry with Ferocious and Swift before going on an expedition to pass some time. I raided several dungeons, bought a Mao with Sirius, at least Punk with Runner, and a Kilimari, all three of which were new pal deck entries. I then died to some Relaxorus, because getting my health bar 3 shot by giant BDI jackasses several levels under me is fun. Another wandering merchant arrived at base shortly after I ran to collect my stuff. With my belongings reclaimed, I checked the breeding calculator again and saw that I could breed my Swift Univolt with a Kelpsy Ignis to get a Fanglope, which can inherit Swift from Univolt. So I did just that, and decided to hang around base until a Swift Fanglope hatched. In the meanwhile, I hatched a ruby, and went looking around for any foods that I could use to increase the work speed of my chicky peas, which turned out to be chicky pea. So I went to collect the meat necessary to turn my chickens into cannibals. After cooking up the chicky pea sautés, I hatched the fangalope egg and got a swift one on the first try, so I swapped her in in place of Wixen. But I quickly realized that I didn't have the saddle available to even unlock for another couple of levels, which kinda sucked, but these levels are about to start flying anyway. And speaking of leveling up, I hatched a Fox Sparks and got a level up, putting the point into carry weight. I then hatched a Caperty and a Spark It before gathering the ingots needed to make metal armor, its heat resistant variant, a Moraith saddle, and the Hip Lantern. Next up the hatch was a Bushi, a Gumas, the Phalaris I mentioned earlier, a Hookertes, and a Tifint. I went on the boss run to let more eggs incubate and for my chicky peas to work, killing yet another lucky pal along the way. Back at home, I replaced one of the berry plantations with a wheat field and had yet another wandering merchant stop by. It was later on that I began to suspect that it was the same one from earlier that was now stuck there. I then hatched a Mossanda and a Rayhound, leveling up and putting the point to stamina, hatched a Woolly Pop, an Incineram, and a Cinnamoth. During a quick shopping run, I bought a Cassius and a Tombat, then went exploring for scorching eggs because I needed a female Pyran Noct. Along the way, I got some schematics for some cold resistant armor and a handgun. At home, I hatched a Cognito, went and gathered materials to craft the Fangle of Saddle, freed a Breesla with Artisan along the way, crafted the saddle back at base, dealt with yet another frigging raid, and shortly after that, I logged off for the night after nearly three and a half hours of managing breeding pairs. But this was just the tip of the iceberg. I did some more exploring the let time pass and came across some pillars in the middle of the ocean. If these pillars were any larger, I would 100% build a base out here, but I needed more space than this, so I moved on. At home, I hatched a Gorirat, a Grizzbolt, and a Ragnahawk, leveling up and putting the point into stamina. From here, I would start mining on occasion just when I needed to pass time. I then hatched a Pyron, a Raindrix, a Foxicle, and a Serpent Terra, built the power generator, hatched a Robinquil Terra, and an Elizabeth, 
built the sphere assembly line to level up the base, hatched the Lunaris with some pretty damn good work traits, hatched a dig toys, and a Moss Sandal Lux. After that, I continued my search for a chickpea to buy, since these two weren't cutting it, and I found one pretty much immediately and returned home with them. I then hatched a Lavander, bought a bunch of eggs from the Wandering Merchant that was stuck in my base, hatched a Dinosum, a Kelpsy, and a Cyblix, leveling up again and putting the point into work speed. I then tore down the two breeding farms I wasn't using, built the production assembly line, crafted a new shield, hatched a beacon and a verdash, and came across not one, but two lucky pals within seconds of each other while out collecting more poultry. At home, I hatched a Veilet, an Azerobe, and a Blaze Howl, and took a short break after that. A few hours later, I hopped back in and built several hot tubs because I was going to build a monitoring stand. I was tired of my chickpeas barely producing eggs, and so I was going to make my pals work a little bit harder. When nighttime came, I was hoping they would regain their sanity while sleeping, but apparently sanity will still drop while they're asleep. So I gave up on the monitoring stand idea and decided I would just buy eggs every now and then. I then hatched a Wumpo, a Felbat, a Relaxaurus, a Quivern, a Memorist, a King Paka, a Warsect, and a Hell Zephyr. After that, I scrolled through the pal deck and noticed I was missing a ton of entries for subspecies, so I immediately got to work on those. From a merchant, I bought a female gobfin since I needed it for gobfin ignis, and set a rush or a maldebris since I needed a sweeve for a hangu crist. I fought bosses to pass the time before hatching an astagon, leveling up and putting the point into carry weight. This, thankfully, was the male astagon I needed to breed for a shadow beak later. I also hatched the gobfin ignis I mentioned a second ago. Here, however, is where this challenge takes a little bit of a turn. I thought I wasn't going to be able to breed for a Suzuku, because in order to breed for one, you need either a pair of them or a Suzuku Aqua. So I initially wrote this off, but then I remembered something. On my main profile, I have hatched multiple Suzuku Aquas from wild eggs. And bred with an Orzerk, which I can obtain, it produces a regular Suzuku. But in order to obtain a Suzuku Aqua egg, I would have to go to an area that is extremely far away and avoid enemies that are level 40. This area was also extremely cold, and I didn't have any cold-resistant armor. While I was hatching a plan on how to move forward, I hatched a Yermantine, a Hangu Christ, a Menacing, which turned out to not be the male I needed, and a Lilene. At this stage, with only subspecies and a couple of regular pals to go, and having to backtrack to breed the right pal in order to get those subspecies, things were slowing down a little bit. While it shouldn't take long to breed for the pals I need, getting the Suzuku Aqua Egg I need might prove to be a little bit difficult. Next time I played, I streamed, and this was also the last session in this challenge. I hatched an Orzark, gathered the materials to make some cold resistant armor, hatched an Ekthrodir Terra, set the armor to craft, and went into the desert to find the Dune Shelter. One of the merchants there sells a thermal undershirt, which I'll need in just a few minutes. After buying the shirt, I returned the base, hatched the Memoris Crist, and a Van Worm Crist. Was raided again, completed the cold resistant armor, and ran north to find huge damp eggs, which contained Suzuku Aqua. I was ready for a long and difficult adventure, but I found the egg pretty much immediately. In order to get a Suzuku Aqua. Oh, and I'm, that might be it, literally right there. Wow. <laughs> Let me grab a few of these just to, to make certain. I did decide to poke around for a second one just in case the one I hatched wasn't the right gender. After finding a second egg, I returned home and set both of them into incubators. I then hatched an Incineram Noct and a Dinosum Lux from a wild egg. And speaking of eggs, I was thoroughly sick of running out of chickpea eggs to cook with, so I went to look for more chickpeas in shops. During this, I discovered that simply leaving an area and causing a merchant to unrender will cycle their shop, so I did that a few times to find some chickpeas, but settled on just buying one. With a new chickpea on hand, I converted the volcano base into a ranch, ripping down the breeding farm, setting down some berry plantations, straw beds, and a ranch. While at home, I was raided yet again, and this time the power of the raiders was enough to basically wipe out everyone at base, including myself. At this point, I was so unbelievably sick of being arbitrarily raided that I went into the world options and turned off raids entirely. My excuse for this is the same as setting my death loss to let me keep my equipment. This isn't a playthrough oriented around combat, so I was perfectly fine with making things peaceful for myself. And with that out of the way, I hatched a Foxicle, leveled up, and put the point into stamina. And after a long wait, I hatched both my Suzuku Aquas, an Elphadran Aqua, and a Relaxaurus Lux before ending off the stream. I didn't quit playing after that, however. The end of this challenge was in sight, and I was going to complete it that evening. I hatched a Reptiro Crist, a Kinkpaka Crist, and a Wumpo Botan. From here, I just needed three more pals. Suzuku, Shadowbeak, and Lilane Noct. And after a bit of waiting, Suzuku was mine. Later on, I hatched the menace thing I needed to breed for Lilene Noct, hatched the Shadow Beak, and finally, after over a day's worth of time put into this challenge, I hatched Lilene Noct. 
But this wasn't the end. You see, when people first start the game, the first pal they would capture most of the time is Lamball. The eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed I don't have one. That's right, after all this time, the pal that's usually everyone's first will be my last for this playthrough. And after a quick stop at the settlement, I buy the final pal I need to complete this challenge. By now, some of you may have asked which pals weren't possible to get. Legendaries aren't possible because you can only capture them, but that's fairly obvious. However, there are two that, to my knowledge, are not possible. That being Blazimut and Broncherry Aqua. Both of these pals have pairings that require itself in order to breed. Blazimut needing a Suzaku, and Broncherry Aqua needing another Broncherry Aqua. And so, after roughly 30 hours and 61 in-game days, that was it for this challenge. It was incredibly fun to undertake, actually, and if you'd like to see more, let me know in the comments. My name is Alexander Moon, and this was Pal World without ever capturing a pal using Pal Spheres.